Hi folks, Paul Fuller here from Bird Dogs of Field TV. You know, last September, uh, Susan and I made our almost annual trip out to Montana for some prairie bird hunting. And uh, we had a good year, it really was good. When we got back, we published two episodes on prairie bird hunting in Montana. And they've gotten a lot of action on both our YouTube channel and our website. But we had an unusual number of people ask us this year, how do you do that? How do you go out to the prairies and hunt? Um, you know, where do you hunt? Where do you stay? So forth. So Susan and I have done a little program here to help you with that. We're going to cover budget, travel distance, uh, where to go what time of the year to go, and uh, see if we can help you there. So both Montana and North Dakota make it relatively easy for hunting upland, upland birds, primarily the sharp-tailed grouse and the Hungarian partridge. And <clears throat> both states are a little bit different, so we'll go over the two differences there. For Susan and me, we go to Sheridan County in Montana. And of course we live in Southern New Hampshire. That means it's uh, over a 2,000, I think it's 2,140 miles one way. And it's a 39 hour drive. So we usually break it up into 13 hours per day of driving. Uh, that's at least two motel nights on the road. So you wanna plan, when it comes to budget, you wanna plan that. Um, and you want to research your motels before you go because you want to find a motel that accepts dogs. And so do your research on, on motels rather than just driving along saying, there's a motel, let's stay here. But uh, for us from New Hampshire, again, it's a 39 hour drive. So if you're in the Midwest, it's probably only maybe a one night drive or, or a one day drive. And that would be very convenient. If I lived in the Midwest, why I'd be there probably without a doubt every year. So, and in addition to the 4,200 mile round trip, we do about 500 miles and travel while we're there to uh, each hunting destination. So needless to say, gasoline is gonna be one of your biggest expenses. So in addition to motel, food, and gas, you don't forget your uh, hunting license fees. In 2019, Montana was 110 for the season. And for North Dakota, for a two-week uh, hunting period, it was $100. I think also in North Dakota, you can, you can buy a second license if you were hunting more than two weeks and that would cost you another $100, but I, I believe that's the, the case there. So Montana and North Dakota are big states, so where do you hunt? For me, for the type of bird hunting I wanna do, that's sharp tails and huns, I would hunt north of Livingston and east of Livingston, all the way to the Canadian and North Dakota border. I think that corner of Montana is best for uh, sharp tails and huns. Uh, in North Dakota, I would hunt west of Fargo all the way to the, to the Montana border. And uh, I think that northwest corner of North Dakota is, is great. So that's, what I, that's where I would take a look. So the big difference between the two states when it comes to hunting is that in Montana, you must have permission from the landowner to hunt, even if the land is not posted. In North Dakota, if the land is not posted, it's open for hunting. So exactly where do you go to hunt? Well, each state publishes a booklet on where to hunt. And in Montana, it's called uh, Block Management. And here's their 2019 booklet. Um, it says Access Guide, Upland Game Bird Enhancement Program Projects. So there's a lot of information here and it's 
full of maps and it shows you where the block management land is. Now block management is where the state has entered into a contract with a landowner which allows non-residents or residents to hunt on that property. It's private property but you you can hunt there. So well, all you have to do is there's a register and it shows you in a book booklet where the registration stations are. But you go to a registration station and you sign in and you, you drop half of your ticket into a box and the other half you keep. And once you've dropped your ticket in, while well, you've registered to hunt on that property, that block management property. And again, it's in the booklet. It shows you the, the, exactly where to go. Uh, in North Dakota, it's different. It's called uh, the Plots Project. And Plots is somewhat similar to Montana, where they enter into a, uh, an agreement with a landowner to allow non-residents or residents uh, the ability to hunt on that property. And one difference is, is you don't have to register. If it's identified as a, as a plot's land, why well, you can go there. And again, they put this booklet out with maps to show you how to get there. And I would say that uh, both are, are pretty good. But uh, again, it block management in Montana and plots in North Dakota. I also want to mention that, uh, and I've got them right here, I never go anywhere without my gazetteer. And although these are full of maps, I love the gazetteer. This is North Dakota and this is Montana. So it's a small investment. I suggest you get a, a uh, gazetteer for each state too. So my tip is whenever you see anybody out working in a field or you see somebody in a yard or if you see some land that looks good that you'd like to hunt, just go knock on the door, talk to people that are out and about in their fields and ask if you can hunt there. That is a prime place to find unpressured birds. And we've had a lot of luck doing that and made some new friends. Well, that's a good, that's a great point, Susan. And trust me, if you've got pointing dogs, you want to be looking for unpressured birds that haven't been pressured by dogs because they hold better for the point. Uh, the sharp tail holds very well early in the season. Huns never hold real well. <laughs> uh, all your dog, your dog can point them, but they just blink once and the sharp tails are in the air. The but, huns. Uh, the huns. Or excuse me. Yeah, the huns. Yeah. The huns are in the air. But sharp tails early on hold well. When to go? Susan and I usually go to Montana in September. Uh, October back home is prime rough grouse and woodcock hunting, and we live for that all year long, so we don't want to miss that in New England. But uh, September is when we usually go to Montana. And when you go that early, you're going to um, uh, potentially encounter some pretty warm days. So you need to make sure that you're carrying enough water both for yourself and your dogs. And we found that a dog uh, hunting, even in, you know, high 60s, low 70s heat, needs about a bottle of water every 15 minutes. So that's, you know, four bottles of water for an hour, plus what you need for yourself. Very good. So go early in September or later in September. So if you don't like the heat, then you might want to go a little later. And one advantage of going later in September is that the crops uh, have a better chance of being harvested if you go a little later. Uh, however, you know, trying to predict when the farmers will be successful in harvesting their crops is kind of a fool's errand because it's all weather dependent for them. So, also, too, another thing is if you don't like bugs, then uh, 
you're going to encounter more bugs earlier in the season, so just bring your bug repellent. Another point about hunting earlier or later in September. Uh, if you want to avoid the early heat in September, then hunt North Dakota because their season starts about 10 days later than Montana. So you can get in on the early bird hunting and still avoid a little bit of that early September heat. So let's talk about traveling with dogs. You know, if you've got several dogs and you use a trailer, uh, traveling in late August, and that's what you would have to do to get to Montana for the September 1st opener, it's gonna be hot. And maybe you don't wanna run your dog, or excuse me, have your dogs in a trailer going across country in August. We have a, uh, a Ram crew cab, so we keep our dogs in the back seat so they can enjoy the air conditioning as we do. And we stop every three or four hours to um, let them out, stretch their legs, do their business and give them some water. But we do try to keep them on their regular feeding schedule of um, two meals a day, morning and, and evening. Let's talk about dog food. For 11 years, we've been feeding native performance dog food. It's a great dog food. <laughs> it, it's not uh, full of any of the fillers that a lot of the commercial brands are. Uh, there's no wheat, soy, corn, which is basically those three ingredients are fillers. They just take up space. They're hard to digest for the dogs, but it's all premium uh, ingredients in native. Uh, it's a three-level system, so you can adjust the level of fat and protein that you want your dog to take in based on, on the activity level. So uh, if, you, if you're running your dog in, in the summer, not, not too often, why level two works fine. That's 26% uh, protein, 16% fat. Uh, if what we do then is around uh, August 1st, if we're starting our hunting in September, we switch to level three, which is 30% protein, 20% fat. And that boosts that energy level up and repairs the damaged tissue from working out quicker. So we love native dog food. Check it out, nativedogfood.com. Uh, I, I really highly recommend it. And let me also talk about um, traveling, uh, the food aspect and traveling with your dog. What I typically do is Mud River puts out a very nice container that holds maybe 33 cups of food in a nice little collapsible container. And I pack that for the road and that works out nicely because then I'll have a separate larger container, actually two separate larger Mud River uh, containers that will take the rest of the food for the for once we arrive and, and get settled in. So that makes that that separate packing of food makes it easy on the road to just for accessibility in the back of the truck and just take out what you what you need for that night, so to speak. Um, and so that's how I pack for the food and then um, <coughs> water. I also wanted to talk a little bit about water. It's very important that you uh, get quality water that you bring with you for the dogs because you uh, different qualities of water can upset a dog's stomach. They can refuse to drink, and that's certainly something that you don't want to have happen uh, on the road. So we start out with cases of, of bottled water and maybe gallons of bottled water and then we will pick up more on the road as the need arises. So we always make sure we have plenty of quality water for them. Certainly I'm not alone in this thinking. I have personally witnessed one pro trainer coming in to set up his uh, training grounds with literally a flatbed full of water containers uh, for the dogs that he was bringing in for summer training. A little earlier in the program, I mentioned motels. Uh, do some research on your motels. Find quality motels. I like a strip motel where I can just back up my truck right to my door and have easy access to my truck 
Uh, we get motels where we can bring the dogs into the room. We have crates that unfold and each dog goes into a crate so they're not up on the beds uh, or on furniture. But, uh, you know, I've read too many times over the years about dogs being stolen from trailers outside of a motel. And I just don't want to take that chance. So I always look for a motel that is uh, easy to get to, has grass where we can walk the dogs both in the evening and in the morning, and, uh, and we can bring the dogs into the room. Since we're talking about dogs and gear, I want to talk a little bit about um, an e-collar. And uh, out in the prairies, you can see for a very long way, so you might think it's hard to get lost or for your dog to get lost. However, in Montana, there are some coolies that once you get down into you, you can't really see where you've come from. So if you're the least bit concerned about straying too far from sight distance from your vehicle, you may want to consider uh, uh, the Garmin Alpha, and that will help keep track of you and your dog. That's right, and uh, if, if you don't care about a GPS and getting back to your truck, uh, or, uh, or you would still like to keep track of your dog, why the uh, Garmin um, uh, 5, 550 Plus, uh, which has added a, a nice feature with a, a little screen on it that shows exactly where your dog is, so you might want to try that too. And so when it comes to gear, we always travel with a vet kit. And in that vet kit, there is uh, saline, EMT gel. I have bandages. I have uh, ice packs, uh, lots of saline for rinsing out eyes, forceps for pulling out quills, all kinds of things that you might need in an emergency out in the field. Uh, and you should also know where the nearest local vet is uh, for something that you may not be able to take care of yourself or needs further attention. We've certainly uh, had that experience with uh, barbed wire on more than one occasion. That's, so, for, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Since we're talking about uh, medical care for our dogs, I, I want to bring up something we refer to as mean seeds. And uh, mean seeds are a grass seed that can get in your dog's nostrils or mouth or eyes and migrate into the body. And once they do that, they will cause infections and often uh, cause death of your dog. So keep your eye out for these grass seeds. They're called on seeds and uh, check the, after each run, put your dog up on your tailgate, check the eyes, check the mouth, look for these grass seeds because they can be very damaging. And if you find one, why, uh, and you're, you're concerned about it, why, then get to, get to a vet. So let's talk about clothing. Clothing I use is, is similar to what I use in early season uh, rough grouse and woodcock hunting, um, but We'll go over it. We'll go over each piece. Uh, this is for a pant. All you need is a lightweight pant. And this is the Orvis Missouri Brake Pant. And uh, I love it. It's, it's a great pant, lightweight, and is perfect for the prairie. Uh, above that, I wear the, this is an L.L. Bean uh, technical hunting shirt, upland hunting shirt. Um, it, uh, it's breathable, uh, it's comfortable, and, uh, and I love it. Now, if it's a real, real chilly morning, I may switch to a chamois shirt rather than this, but I like this shirt a lot. And, uh, and then above that, I wear the L.L. Bean, uh, Tech hunting jacket, and this is for the morning. This is the the bean hunting tech hunting jacket, 
and it's uh, it's waterproof. So if it rains, why you're in good shape there. Lightweight, uh, very comfortable, and I enjoy this very much too. So the difference then between the morning and the and the afternoon is in the afternoon I'll just have this shirt on, and then this is the the lightweight. L.L. Bean Tech Hunting Shirt, Upland Hunting Shirt. And then I will add uh, an older Orvis vest I have. Vest, um, and this is great. Pockets for shells, for birds. And uh, this is made by Orvis. And I, I assume they still have it. I, I don't know. I've had this for several years. But uh, that's pretty much my clothing um so for my clothing i also do lightweight hunting pants for montana and i just buy men's hunting pants whether lightweight or heavyweight and i go by the waist and length size and it works really well for me i will say though that for hunting shirts boyd harness makes women's hunting shirts and I have uh, some lightweight ones, medium weight ones that I really like a lot from Boyd Harness. And I typically wear a hoodie when in, in chillier weather and I'll just layer up underneath it. Um, for um, a vest, I don't really like wearing a lot of vests because they tend to feel heavy once you start putting things in your pockets. You've got you've got a lot of weight that's hanging off your back or your sides. And so I have found happiness in my Filson um, belt vest. And with that, I can pack lots of water, birds, whatever I need. Um, so that's what I do for gear. And we're always, um, we always, we are always going through supplies of lightweight leather gloves too. Right, the, the Bob Allen shooting glove, is which we, we both wear this glove and we just mm -hmm. love it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great glove that takes us right through September, October, and uh, we really, really like that glove a lot. So, but don't forget your footwear, and also don't forget to pack some rain gear. Um, in the prairies, if it rains hard enough for you not to be hunting, it won't matter if you have rain gear, but... Because I've either seen it just not rain or rain in, in, to such capacity that it's difficult to be out there. But anyway, pack your rain gear. And then for footwear, on wet mornings, I might wear a rubber boot. But um, for dry times or half dry times, this thorough good Apex Predator is awesome. It's waterproof. It's uh, made in the USA, which I love. It's extremely lightweight and extremely comfortable. I highly recommend them. Thoroughgood Apex Predator. Well, Susan, thanks for bringing up boots. I almost forgot that. Uh, and, you know, they may be the most important part of your entire wardrobe when you go upland hunting because we walk so many miles and you've got to have good footwear. Uh, I wear two boots when I'm in the prairies. If, if it's not raining hard or uh, dry, I wear the, the Thoroughgood Verocity GTX boot, uh, non-insulated, and it's lightweight, very comfortable, very comfortable. It is waterproof, but uh, it's, it's just a great boot, the Thoroughgood Verocity GTX boot. It's just, I just love it. And this, this has some mud on it, so you can tell it's well used. For rubber boots, I wear the 17-inch Thoroughgood Mossy Oak Bottomland boot. This is a fantastic boot, and it's new to the market, and so you've got to check it out. You've got to go to their website, the Thoroughgood website, and check it out. But this is a fantastic boot, very comfortable and it's going to be with me on all of my hunting trips. I can guarantee that. A brief word about guns. I shoot a side-by-side. -side. It's simply what I grew up with. 
I have a Merkel side by side, 20 gauge, 28 inch barrels. Uh, it's IC mod choked, in other words, improved cylinder in the right barrel and modified in the left. Uh, I shoot a, an RST number seven shot in the right barrel, which we shoot first. And then in the left barrel, with my apologies to my good friends at RST, I shoot a high brass. And I shoot a high brass number six. Uh, because in the prairie, some of those second shots are fairly long. And if you're going to take the shot, well, you want to make sure you have a good load to get your bird and not just wound the bird. So that's what I do with a sh for a shotgun. And uh, Susan, you want to say a word about yours? Sure. I have the same cylinders as Paul, the improved and modified, except I shoot a over and under Caesar Guarini uh, with 26 inch barrels and it's lightweight and easy for me to handle. So I hope this little primer has helped you plan your next trip to the prairies and no matter where you hunt, stay safe and have fun. Good. And hopefully we'll meet you someday on the prairies. Bird Dogs Afield, presented by Native Performance Dog Food and brought to you in part by RST Shot Shells, Mud River Dog Products, Peach Shoe Dryer, Thoroughgood Footwear, and Merkel Shotguns.